All right, we got a highlight on our hands, everybody. 30k against the Hardos. A best of a five a series here at the Masters Clash. It is play day number three, and both of the teams have already done extremely well. We have the teams in the number two and the number three position right now in the ranking. The Hardos are in second place, and 30k is in third place. And this is one of the games that should give us quite a few fireworks. That should be pretty awesome. Uh, I'm honestly excited because both of the teams are supposed to be high up in the standings at the end of the season. Both of them are expected to be at least within the top three, which I think is going to happen one way or another. It would be, I mean, honestly, it would be insane if one of the two teams would drop out of the top three. That would be a huge upset. The question is really, can one of them lock in that number one spot or not? Currently, the donuts hold that. But it's going to be the battle between the three teams here that we're going to see for a long time. So, for now, we got our bands coming in. Tomb of the Spider Queen gives us also the early Urel pick in a first pick position here from Dequaza. And, yeah, with Medivh banned out, Sonia banned. We still got Chromie up as a potential pick, which is oftentimes taken, of course. You're looking at Wave Clear a bit as an uh, obstacle here on Tomb of the Spider Queen. And Bad Benny is locking his variant in immediately. Like, immediately. This is absolutely amazing that he just doesn't waver at all. Honestly, last play day, he had a couple of different hero picks. He played, I think, it was uh, Diablo once, and he had another one, but either way, we're going to see a similar setup now, but we might get a ban on Stukov or a pick for 30k, maybe even a ban on Stukov and pick or ban on Malfury and something along those lines. And now it's my F uh, and Diablo instead. But yeah, it's party time. So, this should, honestly, this is probably one of the best heroes of the Storm matches that we're going to have this season, the battle between those two. And every single map matters. If you can win this one, with a 3-1 victory, a 3-0 victory, even if every single map is going to be highly contested, that would be such a fantastic step towards a number one position. Uh, yeah, it's pretty incredible. But let's go. Especially the Hardos have stepped it up massively lately. Now, 30k was, of course, the team that qualified for the Masters Clash first. During the first qualifier, they were able to win the tournament. And then, when the two teams faced off against each other again, that was in the Rive Cup. It was the Hardos that took it, but it's party time now. This is for all the marbles, more or less. Diva gets banned, Stukov gets banned too. So, uh, Dibbles plus Urel always reminds me of the oldie but goldie combo in uh, HTC. I don't know if you remember that, but HTC Europe for, I want to say, like four weeks was absolutely dominated by Urel, Diablo, and Deckard Kane. Whenever a team locked those three heroes in, it was pretty much unbeatable. I don't think that combo lost even once. I think it had 100% win rate. It was absolutely nasty. Now, Deckard gets now taken on the side of the Hardos, and obviously it's not quite the same anymore since this is four years ago or so. Therefore, uh, there's a lot that happened since then with patches, other heroes being introduced, and so on and so forth. But now we got Leo locked in. We got Deckard Kane, as I said. Yasu, Yasu is this time on his main account, by the way. <laughs> He's actually on his main account. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, I was earlier thinking, hey, which which Smurf account is he going to use today? Last two picks for 30k, and there's the Malfurion follow-up together with Greymane. And that is a nasty one. Malf plus Diablo, last pick coming in for Nick. And what is he going to get? Because so far, with the minigun follow-up after Varian's taunt, they got Kane for the lockdown. It's a solid setup for them. This is a map where in the past they played a lot of Kerrigan. And Nick has been in this weird set up this weird twilight zone where he does a lot of damage lately but he also yolos a lot and dies a lot so what are we going to see from him today Kerrigan it's Kerrigan they're starting off with Kerrigan right away here on Tomb of the Spider Queen <laughs> and I'm totally game for it they're hardos against 30k heroes of the storm here on the European server with the Masters Clash we're on the third play day so let's jump in straight into game number one Tomb of the Spider Queen ladies and gentlemen Game number one. Oh yeah, we're in for a highlight. We're in for a treat. Heroes of the Storm with 30k and the Hardos. 
on the left side of the map. X-Ray on Malfurion for 30k here on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Dequaza on Urel Dainu on Greymane Ultralisk playing one of his favorites. He's playing my F. And we have Masquerade on Diablo. On the right side of the map, Bad Benny has so often with Varian. We got Hazo Ops on Tychus for the follow-up with a minigun. Chris on Leo, Nick on Carrigan, and Yazu with a Deckard K, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get the show on the road here. Which team can take the lead in the best of five series? And who can win it here today? And establish that position up at the top. Oh, <laughs> the Wall of the Warden already being used as Ultralisk has to get away from the stun. That could have been a little bit annoying already. But, well, either way, now that we are looking at Chris, he's still ghosting back down to the bot lane. But, of course, with Masquerade and Diablo, there's a lot of bullying potential now. And he's going to try and combo off with X-Ray every single time. Or, well, more so the, more so the other way around. So every time that Masquerade tries to get the wall stuns through and starts to flip the target over, the root will be ready. And X-Ray is just going to set up Grey Main whenever he gets an opportunity so they can get a kill. Now, the rotation is already happening. And they are starting to pressure Nick a bit as he's moving between the lanes. Yeah, quick move straight into uh, the middle now, of course, as well. Trying to go for Bad Benny, who has to be careful. Hazorps also pushing this back a little bit as Masquerade is starting to get the stacks together for his baseline to increase the hit point pool a little bit. Of course, the gems are also locked in slowly. We got the Austin's Renewal for Leo, so he has some additional self-sustain. And Bad Benny is already pushing the pressure onto, Mask onto Daiquaza. And every single rotation like this towards the solo lane is always impactful because if it does damage, it means that your own solo Solo laner is having an easier time dominating the lane and therefore just a quick move like this couple of seconds are a huge win ultral is eating a lot of damage here already too now there's no level four for hazards yet so if he goes for in the rhythm that would of course have been a nice starting point getting some mini stacks in early on normally has a big impact and the bruiser cam that has now spawned at the one mini mark is now also taken and they're still looking at a bit of a trap, but there's no one here. So there's no one that they can collapse onto. Instead, the camp has now been taken. And instead of taking their own camp, the red team wasted a little bit of time hoping for a quick gank here. Now, it's not really that they could know about this in any way, so they were trying to set up a trap, but the uh, little gamble that we had for the blue team worked out quite nicely for them. We got the Ruby on level 4 for Deckard Kane. Hazorps has made a choice yet, but here comes Varian with the taunt, and they're going for X-Ray, the beautiful flank, follow up, and that's the kill. Bird Boy is down, Malfurion is dead. And we get the bigger they are from Hazo. They want to chunk Diablo down as much as they can. And every time that Nick is going to move in with Carrigan or Bad Benny with the taunt, we're going to see Hazo Ops ready with the trade and the minigun and trying to deliver the damage here. Nice opening kill for the Hardos. And that flank hit Malfury and hard. That's definitely what X-Ray is going to try and prevent throughout the entire game. They need to keep an eye on Varian so that, they can't, that this can't happen again. And Varian is already going for it again. Varian is here. The follow-up from Carrigan instantly. And it was a beautiful follow-up kill here. So, yeah. Just to give you a bit of an idea, that's how quickly you can get these kills connected. I mean, look at the setup. In comes the taunt. Carrigan with a combo following up on the target that couldn't even move. And that's another kill in the books. And they're going for Dibbles. They're getting another kill against Diablo here with the exact same pattern. And the rotation between the lanes is so unbelievably aggressive right now. It works wonders for them. Instead, the blue team is now aiming for a kill at the bottom against Leoric. That would have been huge if they could have taken it down. Simply because it would have allowed them to steal 20 of the gems away from their opponent. But as it stands, Leoric gets away and top lane has now taken some damage too. They're still going at least for the Siege Giants at the bottom of the map. But it's an early lock on the level 7 talent and also a pretty dominant position on the turn-in. Which means that we have 35 gems delivered. Chris is trying to complete the turn-in. Can't quite make it happen. Yeah, Divine Steed is in. And on top of that, we also got the Drain Momentum. Bit of an action here in the middle. The taunt on Diablo. And it didn't really do too well this time.
But you don't have to get a kill every single time that you execute the combo. Just the threat alone is already a big deal. Of course, we got the Nature's Cure now on level 7 for him. The Equaza is getting zoned out a bit. And that means that Chris can complete the turn in. The first Web Weaver wave, therefore, is going to hit the ground running soon for the Hardo. So we're looking at 3 kills to 0 at this point. And Bad Benny is already looking for another setup. Dino is a bit far out here. They want to go for the kill against Nick. And if they can get this one, that would be the dream. And they go for Carrigan, and they drop her. They gotta keep Diablo alive, though. Boom, oh, Fury destroying, but the taunt is just too much. And then Varian comes in with the rest of the team to drop the main tank. It's a kill for a kill, and it could have been just such a great setup for 30k for the defense. If they had a 5 versus 4 going on for them, that would have been fantastic. But as it stands, it's a 4 versus 4 setup. Carrigan is back on the way, back on the map. And now we are looking at the mid lane where they're breaking through the wall and gate already. Easy peasy. Yeah, trying to do some damage here. Maybe even eliminate a fountain or two up at the top. My F has already defeated the Web Weaver. Bottom of the map, the same has more or less happened. Still decent defense. They lost some structures. They lost the wall. They lost some towers. But it's not really too bad yet. And that, that is a big bully play against Bad Benny, who still gets out. Little Toy Soldier Varian is able to walk away from that big gank against him. That must be kind of frustrating. And Chris, of course, has used that time at the bottom of the map to go straight up for some extra damage. Gets the drain connected with Urella. She rotates in. We still got some action here in the middle as the blue team is now trying to get a web weaver wave themselves. But of course, the gap to level 10 is very, very small now. And Maiev dies. Maiev is actually down, gets caught. And that's a level 10 and a potential second turn. And they got 50 gems already. And two, he dodges it, but Dino still dies. And this is starting to spiral out of control a bit. Now, you might have guessed it already, but this was the map choice of the Hardos. Nicely done, by the way, by the blue team. De Quaza is able to not only save his own ass here on the Space Goat, but also lock in the turn-in. So they avoid the double turn-in for the Hardos. Nicely done. Good job by Urel. And since Mayev is now back to business and Greymane is reappearing on the map, they should be able to push with this and try to get some counter pressure. But as I was about to mention, this is again the map choice of the Hardos. And I've been talking in uh, the previous two play days about how well they do on Tomb of the Spider Queen in general. I don't think they have lost a map here yet in the last two or three months. They are absolutely insane on this map. They're doing so well here. And the trend continues, at least in the early game. But thanks to the turn in, 30k is not completely out of this. They're actually in a position where they might be able to bring this back, but Nick connects another combo. Ultralisk is already coming out. X-Ray is getting attacked, but they're still trying to bring it back here. Web Weavers at the top lane and at the bot lane. Ult comes out. The old man again telling stories. And the follow-up from Carrigan for the stun against Dibbles. Even they got Kane chipping in with another seal. But the wall has still fallen. And they're trying to go for more. Blue team wants to go for the fountain. And they're going to get this one easy peasy. They're pushing them back even further. And Odin has to be popped too. But I think this could be the end of the top four. They're likely going to lose it. It's insanely low already, but Diablo maybe a little bit too deep. The taunt, the root, Ultralis. They're going for Leo. He gets out. Masquerade is also still alive. And everybody is able to escape, but the fort has indeed fallen. Six kills to one, but on structures, 30k has taken the advantage now. Nice. So, as it stands, 27,000 damage for Tychus. They stole his cigar, they made him super mad, he got incredibly angry, and he is venting all that anger in a very healthy way by killing people in the Nexus. So with 20,000 damage, he is already the top dog on the damage numbers. 21,000 for my F2, looking still for all that vengeance. Ultralisk here with 11 gems, and there is a bit of a gem lead for the Hardos. I mean, naturally, they have five additional kills. It's only normal that they would have stolen away some of the gems of the opponent. Oh, well, not stolen away, but you know what I mean. But, of course, now the big question is who can get the next turn-in? Both have enough for a full completion. Neither has turned in a single gem just yet, but it's soon going to happen one way or another. The level 13 talents are a little bit quicker for the Hardos, so they got that. Slight advantage for them here. And Ultralisk is looking for that tether. Chrysalis is in this time. On level 13, we got the Juggernaut after the Warbringer. And at the same time now, the Spectral Leech plus the Chrysalis. All right. 
Pain Train is coming. Bad Benny. Yeah, already coming in with a turn in, and the gems are there. Red Web Weavers are going to be descending, but they're trying to at least set the camp up on the lane so that they have an easier defense right there. Masquerade on Diablo, always a huge bully. I mean, he is just pushing people around here on the sofa. <laughs> He's cleaning the fight up. But yeah. This is going to be the important one, because right now the Hardos, they need to do some work. They have already opened up some of the walls, they have prepared for this push, but now they are trying to aim for the forts themselves. And they are setting it up in the middle with a few additional heroes. The camp is of course slowing it down, as I already talked about, and it allows the blue team to go for the fence at the top and at the bottom first. But it's the mid lane where everything is centering on. There's the Apoc. Oh, the kill against Maiev. And even X-Ray wasn't able to save the target here. Carrigan is just popping off. Nick had a couple of meh performances over the last couple of days. But now he's popping off on Carrigan again. And he is just putting a number on them. 28 gems are lost as X-Ray falls. It's a double kill for the Hardos. And they are just barreling through that mid lane. They are absolutely crushing everything here. Going through the middle like hot butter through cheese as they are coming straight in for the next minion wave, for the next keep, for the next tower. And now the rotation is going to hit the top lane where they're attempting to take another fort down. And Leo, he's doing the same thing at the bottom of the map. Chris has nearly succeeded in taking the fort down here too. And Equaza with the 32 gems needs to be careful as well. Top fort is about to fall. It is an absolute beatdown now. And the problem, of course, is it's not only that you're losing structures. You lose like, experience, and thanks to the seven additional kills that we're seeing for the Hardos, they not only have another turn in available now, they also have a level 16, which pretty much makes it impossible at this point for 30k to contest anything. So the 16 talent is in. We get the Mithril Mace after the Spectre Leech, so the auto attack style. And they even aggroed the boss. So they can go for the web weaver wave. They can go for the boss. They can go for everything. And what can the blue team do? Nothing. What are you going to do? Fight the boss with a level 16 talent on your opponent's side while you only have a level 13? This is not happening. So right now, boss is claimed. Web weaver is moving in. And they are going for an absolute punishing push at the top lane as they are trying to go for the win now. And it's 16 versus 16, so at least the blue team has even talents now for the defense. But it's still going to be pretty nasty. 31,000 damage for Tychus, 23,000 for Maiev, but this push is going to hurt a lot. Nick is the only one that died once. Urel, by the way, the only player or the only hero on the blue team that hasn't fallen yet even once. The mid lane gets attacked, Maiev is trying to hold on to the keep as much as she can. At the top, of course, there's no stopping this push. And the only question is, can they go for core, yes or no? And it seems like they're not trying to uh, push it too much, unless they can get a kill, of course, and with a taunt, they might. They go for Maiev, and she is dead. Even the Apocalypse cannot stop it. The Chrysalis is out, Dino in trouble. The old man with the sleeper set up the Entomb as a follow-up. There's the double, there's the triple kill, and they are crushing it. Carrigan is dead, but there's no stopping the Hardos anymore. Anymore. They're gonna lock in the victory in game number one. Tomb of the Spider Queen gets taken by the red team. Nicely done. The Hollows with the lead in the Heroes of the Storm best of five on the third play day of the Masters Clash. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. All right, Towers of Boom, everybody. 30k against the Hardos. Well, let's go. Hardos with a really good showing on the first map. They just dominate on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen. I'm still waiting for teams to start to ban Tomb against them because it just feels so at home there. And I think in all... Most of the games that we've seen recently, it was the most dominant map from their perspective in pretty much every single series. So, right now, we got Towers of Doom coming in, another one that is, of course, a favorite of theirs. It's their map choice again, since 30k opted for first pick, first ban. But let's get the party started. Apparently, there were all so a couple of problems in the last game for Ultralisk, so his internet connection was always a bit of a meme 
I don't know where exactly he lives. I think he's like in the middle of nowhere. So I have no clue. But he always had some issues with his connections. And oftentimes we have to pause the game because he's disconnecting and has to reconnect. Doesn't really happen a lot lately. But in the last game, apparently he disconnected once and that led to a kill on Mayev. The blue team immediately wrote in the chat and said like, hey, there's a disconnect issue, but apparently the kill was already underway, so it happened. The players talked a bit about it during uh, in the lobby of game number two. It wasn't a big deal, no drama, everything was fine, but just a little bit of uh, extra information for you guys that there were apparently some issues for him. So hopefully that's all resolved, that game number two can run smoothly from their perspective. We have a couple of adjustments in the draft, as this time Varian is banned out. So uh, that oftentimes led in the past to Bad Benny going for a Nuburak instead is something that they uh, might try and do now. We still have Uther banned out. We got the uh, Medivh banned, which of course leaves Chromie, for example, up. It's also a bigger map, so we could see a Falstead play again. Just trying to exploit the globals a little bit more. With Dino on the side of the blue team, there's a chance of uh, Zeratul being played again. Even the Malfurion plus Tracer combo has been re-emerging after the recent patch. Instead, we're getting Deckard Kane and May on the other hand. Okay, so, yeah, with those being set up, we got our bands coming in. Still got to be a little bit careful, especially around what Dino is going to pick. I mean, honestly, Dino and Ultralisk got both a bit of an X Factor on the th uh, side of 30k because they have a pretty versatile hero pool where they can uh, always fit. Like, they can always adjust a bit to what the opponent plays, but they also have a lot of very strong assassins and mobile ones that can be game changers in any composition. And there's the Zeratul ban for exactly that reason, making sure that Dino is not going to rip their backline a new one. Now, what do you ban out against a bad Benny and Nick now? That's the bigger question. Nick is another one that could also zip around with Tracer and has done so multiple times. You could try and ban out even more supports, could get rid of Malfurion, for example. You could try and target Bad Benny at the front a bit more. If you're still worried about these engage comps, then maybe go for Nubarak. Instead, they go for Brightwing, who can always supply the extra Polymorph and therefore more CC, but also has the global presence on the map. But what's going to be the play now? here on Towers. What exactly are the Hardos going to do? They dominated game number one. Did a fantastic job there. But can they continue that streak? Can you imagine a 3-0 victory for them? How insane that would be. And there it is. The combo that I just talked about. Nick and Yasu with Malfurion and Tracer. Okay, so. Game's up. You know exactly what's coming. And how do you react to that? You need something that can do direct damage to Tracer. Auto attackers are always nice against her. Any point and click is great. Skill shots against Tracer are always a little bit dicey. You want something that can either stun lock her, that can control her, slow her down. May can help a bit with that. But any kind of direct damage is fantastic. And Sergeant Hammer fits the bill. Auto attacks that hit hard. You get Dino together with this on Genji. And Tracer might have a problem here. So that's a setup that is not shabby at all. And it will be interesting how the team in red reacts to it. It's kind of funny too that we are now seeing a Sergeant Hammer played against Hazu. He's usually the one that plays it. But again, it's always the Germans that are locking in the, the Panzer over here. So in this case, it's uh, Ultralisk as it seems. Last pick, Bad Benny. What are we getting? It is Diablo. Yeah, the Diablo Malfurion combo that we've seen in the last game played by 30k is now in the hands of the Hardos. And that's House of Doom. Heroes of the Storm continues with our two teams in the top three of the European ranking. So let's see what 30k can do. They gotta step it up a little bit. Towers of Doom incoming. Map number two in our best of five. Game number two. Towers of Doom. Ultralisk on Sergeant Hammer coming in with the heavy auto attacks against Tracer. And of course, the siege potential on the structures. We got X-Ray in game number two on Deckard Kane. Dino is playing Genji. Masquerade on May and Dayquaza on Diva. On the right side of the map, the Hardos with the lead in the best of five series. We have Hazops on Cassia, Yasu on Malfurion, Bad Benny is playing Diablo, Nick is introducing the cavalry to Heroes of the Storm again with Tracer, and we have Chris on Sonya for the slam and bam. Okay, party time. We have level 1 stacking for Cassia, but we're going to keep an eye on those Lightning Fury stacks. And we are good to go with the Devil's Do on level 1 now for the Hardos. So yep, all about the regeneration globes and trying to lock that in. 
already waiting for the rotation. Masquerade is trying to slow it down as the bot lane is attempting to do some damage with Sergeant Hammer. And that is working nicely for them. So good job. And with that, let's go and see what they can uh, do right now. First of all, Hammer needs to reach level 7, of course. That has the extra mobility. Bit of a control against Cassia. Yeah, nice. On level 1, we this time have the Ice Storm coming in. So no heat transfer over here. Chris is getting attacked at the top, by the way. Tries to go for the spear. Misses it. And that amount of damage against Sonya forces her into an early uh, fountain tap. And that means that the lane is going to look really good for D.Va. Unless, of course, there's a rotation of players from the Hardos to the top lane and trying to balance that out again. But D.Va definitely has a nice stance now. Same time, though, the rotation into the middle in an attempt to get some damage connected with Bad Benny here, who's already rotating away. X-Ray keeps himself in the back. Meg is a little bit low. The stun connects, and the pilot might be in trouble. The Quasa goes down as the slam connects. Nicely done. Chris came in and dropped the damage, and that is kill number one in this game. And they are immediately trying to capitalize on this. It's a small advantage that they get, but the first thing that they do is they move straight up for the opponent's pumpkin camp to steal that away. And since there's no mobility just yet for 30k on Sergeant Hammer, there's nothing that they can really do about it. D.Va wasn't back, so that was a fantastic move by the Hardos. If you take a lead, try to extend it. Try to capitalize on kills, and that's exactly what they showcased perfectly in this situation. So, well, nicely done. But at this point, what else are we going to have? We have another camp being attacked, of course. They're going to try to go for this one, too. The siege tactics are now in for Sergeant Hammer. That's already some additional survivability. The shielding potion for Deckard Kane has also now connected. And they're going for Sonya in an attempt to take Chris down, who's really low, but is still able to make it out. The Quasar with the explosion here takes down the minion wave, so good for him. Camp has been taken at the bottom right by the red team, and Ultralisk has to zip out with Sergeant Hammer. But once that level 7 is in, the situation is going to become get a little bit better for them. Bad Benny? Yeah, so far, nobody... No ah, well, it was an attempt. Didn't really realize where he was. Dino can move out, so not a problem for him in this case. But yep, it is a spicy one. A lot of rotations happening between the lanes. Both of the teams are trying to establish small leads on the lanes, get a kill set up. Only one thus far in the game, but now the triple altar phase is starting up. And D.Va is in trouble again and dies once more. Dayquaza. And that is a problem because this could very well lead to a double altar up at the top. One channel has already happened at the bottom of the map. Dainu is now rushing away and is able to escape, but it's still two altars against one in favor of the Hardos as they channel this one too. And that's in total eight shots fired against four. So a slight advantage for the Hardos as the game starts. Towers of Doom has always been a comeback map. The uh, late game is what really matters here. You want to gain that momentum and you have the opportunities to get some bell tower conversion going. And now that level 7 is just so close for the blue team too, they're going to get the Hava Siege mode for Sergeant Hammer. But of course it's a little bit quicker here on the side of the Hardos as we are seeing the nature's cure after the rejuvenation. And in comes the stun into the wall. Dino Swift strikes out. But there it is. Hover Siege Mode is in. And that's where the real fun begins for Sergeant Hammer. This is where you try to go for your Protect the Hammer setup. And just do yeah, Siege up on any kind of structure whenever you have a proper 4 or 5 man ready. With of course the rotation still going on of your solo laner as they're trying to lock in the experience. But yep. 2 kills to 0. Not a single one just yet, but Nick is moving in for the extra damage again. I mean, he's needling them. This is the thing with Tracer. You just come in and you just needle the hit points down uh, time and time again. We got 10,000 damage on the side of Sonya. She's the first one to cross over into the five digits. Hanzo is sitting at nearly 9,000 for the blue team, but they're not quite there yet. Bottom of the map, single altar is now spawning, so we're going to see a bit of a party over this, but there's still no heroic abilities for the teams. That's a bit of a trap set up. Masquerade walks straight for it, is trying to get the CC connected. They're going for Chris and Sonia. Oh my god. Ah, oh, they save her again. Unbelievable. I really thought that Chris would finally die, 
was close to falling already once earlier on, but in this case, he gets away again. And yeah, nicely done, also by the support. Talk about support, Deckard Kane is down, damn, they got caught here. The rotation again interrupted by the Hardos, and they are driving a wedge between the parts of the team, and it is again D.Va that might be in trouble here. The Quasar gets attacked. Genji is doing the best he can, but down at the bottom of the map, Haas Orbs is completing the channel on the altar, and that extends the lead that the Hardos have in this game. 28 against 36 to count now. The Quasar moving back towards the top side, and as you can of course already tell at the bottom of the map, there's another camp that is currently taken by the Hardos. And on oh my god, really? Nick! How do they survive time and time again? Every single engage that happens here. It is bananas. They're just getting away over and over again. And level 10 is of course a huge deal now too for the Hardos. So they got it early and they have leaps. So they're going to play this very aggressive. And Hammer has to be careful in the backline now too. But we had level 10 abilities on both sides. And yep, they're trying to go for Nick again. <laughs> Ados haven't lost a single player yet. That's three kills to zero. The extra for Genji, which gives him, of course, some additional mobility too. And they're making the play for D.Va again. De Quasa, cautious. But, yep, altars are going to be announced at the bottom of the map again. It's going to be another double altar setup. And it's continuous poke that we're seeing from the team here. So, well, let's go. In comes May. Masquerade is sitting at the side. Can he lock someone down? That's the bigger question. Not so much. Yeah, trying to go for Yasu though. The wall, but it just doesn't connect properly. Now, the cooldown isn't really all that long, but it might be leading into a fight where they cannot use the ult on May for quite some time here. So, yeah, with only 14 seconds left until the altars are up, could be a bit of an issue. Either way, we got... Diva in a position at the side here, just waiting this one out. Down at the bottom of the map, Ultralist now, of course, has also the range and the mobility that he can uh, have much more of an impact on the interrupt. And he's going to try to use that, so they're zoning them out already, you know, and Ultralist is getting in position for this. Bad Benny was trying to interrupt the channel, but couldn't make it work, so that's the first couple of shots fired. And with the BFG, they interrupted Sonya in the mid lane channel. So the second Alder gets fought over, and... The oh, the combo, the leap! Dino, he jumped out! The kill against Sonya, finally she is dead. The Apo comes in, but again, it's Diva that just gets crushed. Bad Benny smashes her into the wall. The pilot is down, but Yasu is completely isolated, and he has no chance. And they are immediately focusing on Cassia to X-ray with the channel. What a setup. And we are tied, everybody. Yeah, it's tied right now. Check this one out. Check this out. It just awesome setup for them. Really well done. The leap, first of all, dodged by Genji. And then they turn it on Chris. They take him down right away. And that leads the uh, entire fight. Now, there's still a lead in experience for the Hardos, but that kill was just so impactful and really, really helped them here. Now we got 28 points on both cores. We had two kills to four, and they are fighting for this. They are being aggressive here. They're going for Masquerade. The wall is up. The trade used, and he catches both of them. They steal the camp away. Nicely done, but can they get a kill too? That would, of course, be the dream here. Valkyrie is already being used against the hammer, but at the same time, they're going for Cassia, and they drop her. They want Yasu too, and Malfurion is low. They leap on Chris in an attempt to save the healer, but there's just no denying that that kill is happening. That's a lead in experience and even in talents for 30k. They're definitely stepping it up big time. Bottom of the map, another lockdown. The old man telling stories again, boring everyone to death. Chris, spin to win and he is dead. The old timer kills him. Sonia starts to bleed out of both ears and finally drops... Five kills to four. Bottom bell tower converter. The momentum. Oh my god. The Hardos with a big, big problem at the end. Yeah, they look at the boss. They might go for D.Va at the top. Sergeant Hammer still holds the bot lane. And they are slowly starting to go for Dequaza. They know where he is. He gets the camp, but can he get out? And the answer is yes. He's able to boost his way 
back was only Dibbles that was still there after the camp was taken. They didn't even try to make a play for it. Sergeant Hammer is still guarding the bottom bell tower and is trying to take those minion waves out as quickly as possible. The shots are fired. It's an even exchange. Five shots against three. And that leads us to a 23 to 25 position in favor of 30k. Yeah, they are all of a sudden in a great position. They have a leading experience. They're doing extremely well on the map. We have a play for maybe even boss at the top. No, they're just trying to set up another trap. But it's now 30. Now they're going for it. They're going for it. They are starting to take it. And so far, 30k hasn't really even thought about contesting that. So boss is about to be taken. 31,000 damage for Tracer, by the way. And 28,000 for Hanzo. And the shots are fired. Boss is claimed, but they still hold on to the bot lane. It honestly feels like 30k just said, guys, we're not going to go for the boss. We don't really want to contest this. We have the lead. Let's just wait it out. The bell tower control is more important. The next altar phase is a triple phase. If we lock in two of them, then we extend the lead even further. So let's just try and play it around that. Either way... At the top, Dequaza is playing it super slow, super safe, behind the wall. They wait for the additional experience. They want level 16, and they also start to control the pumpkins at the bottom. Whereas the red team is hoping for a rotation. They are setting traps up the entire time. You might have seen it on the minimap, but the entire time they were just like sitting at the sides, hoping for someone to move between the lanes up towards the top and fall into the trap. And it just doesn't, didn't happen. Now we have a triple altar phase coming up. There's a level 16. The Valkyrie is missing, but they're collapsing onto Deckard Kane with the leap and everything. And they get the kill. Oh, <laughs> the BFG into the face of Malfurion. <laughs> oh, the kills. Unbelievable. What a setup again. Quick and dirty. That's how I like it. They're coming in with a quick drop on Deckard Kane, and then Malfurion dies too. And they're stealing everything. Oh my god. Guys, that's 10 shots fired. 10 fired, and they go for the altar at the top too. This is, by the way, that started all of this. Check this one out. X-Ray tries to move around, gets stunned into the wall, the leap on top of him, and then he is dead. And, uh, well, Malfurion dies shortly after, but that's exactly what they needed. We had 8 points to 21. 8 to 21, and, yeah, it's getting, it's getting nasty over here. That was huge. Absolutely huge. Triple altar locked in with a 5 to 3 bell tower position. 30k have taken an incredible lead here. So now it's still not really a whole... It's not a lot of an advantage. It's, it's, the experience gain is not a lot. They're not heavily ahead or anything. Talents are the same. But of course it's undeniable that right now you are in trouble. The wall stops Deckard Kane as the Valkyrie connects. Ultralisk is playing this incredibly safe at the bottom of the map now. And yeah top lane they're pressuring this out a bit they open the wall up they're trying to also create some space here down at the bottom of the map it's nick that gets attacked oh ho, 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 ho. they connect with the bfg cassia the wall is up they're trying to create some extra space and zone them out but now that diablo is back to business they are falling back they don't want to fight this just yet but holy hell this game 43 stacks for cassia now but I gotta say that this is a fun one. Two more altars and it's over. 30k wins it. Unless, of course, the altar situation changes. But it seems like they're gonna need two one way or another. Chris is waiting for that leap. They're setting up around the camp at the top. And if anyone pops their head out, it's gonna be Heroes of the Storm back a mole. Yeah, they're trying for it. Masquerade is right there. He knows exactly what's happening. They're going for Bad Benny. At the bottom, Diva is trying to drive a wedge between the parts of the team. And now the Hardos are making a move. But Cassia is zoned, there's the apocalypse, and Masquerade, he is down. Masquerade is dead, and X-Ray is also in trouble. It's a double kill, and now they can go for the camp. Well done. And of course, this all happens just as the bell tower is open and the altar is spawning. They can't really get it yet, but still, great setup for them. Yeah, I mean, that was just beautiful. So they get the kill against Mei, then they can de take Deckard Kane down, and that's an immediate move straight up for the camp that helps them now to take that bell tower right here. Great setup. 
Seven kills to six, and it's just back and forth. Exactly what you would expect on uh, Towers of Doom match. We have the top side pressure against the Bell Tower. So 30k is trying to repay the favor and respond in kind with the Bell Tower conversion. But they're a little bit late on the move back out. I mean, Dino can use a Swift Strike, but Dequaza might be in trouble. Yeah, he might die. They stayed too long. They stayed way too long, and there's just no way for the pilot to survive this. So that's a little bit of a Sudoku move right there. And that could be a problem. If you start to stagger a couple of deaths over here, you might lose that game after all. That lead was quite nice, but it's already been reduced. And now we're looking at 8 points to 17. They still haven't retaken the bot lane either. So that's a bit tricky. It's a single altar that pops up next in the middle. And with Sergeant Hammer, you honestly shouldn't have a problem retaking that bell tower. Eventually, it's going to happen. 43,000 damage from Genji now. 41,000 for Ultralisk Hammer. And there's a level 20 talent. So now the Hardos have a lead again, and it's an entire level lead that they have together with it. So there's a lot that comes together here. There's a boss up on the map, there's an altar that's spawning, and this is where the Hardos can make a huge dent into the defense of 30k. Especially since there is no Storm talent yet. And Dainu, he can't die right now. You can't die when uh, D.Va just came back. And well, there it is. They kill against Genji. He thought he could get away, and Bad Benny said, like, nope, ain't happening, my friend. It's not happening, and of course we're going to take another look at it. I mean, check it out. Up at the top, he tries to get some extra damage in, thinks he can get away, moves into a wrong spot. Bad Benny says, ooh, a wall. Jumps in, crushes him, stuns him, and, well, that is an easy kill. And now another five shots fired. 12 to 8. They're waiting for level 20. They're trying to get a bit more damage in. Hazorbs dodges out on the BFG though, so he doesn't die here. But they can retake the uh, bell tower for sure. Now as it stands, it's 12 points to 8. So there's still an advantage for 30k. But obviously the lead that they had is now slowly getting removed here. It doesn't change the fact that a single team fight can still win you the game. 64 stacks now for Cassia. And at this point, of course, it's all about uh, 20. And they're going for boss too. They want to draw completely even. And since Genji isn't back yet, they can get this one. The Ultra Capacitators are in. Respect the elderly. We got the Shatter. And they're trying to make a bit of a play. But they really need... I mean, honestly, they are really aggressive on this. Boss is already taken. I guess they assumed that it wasn't really too far gone yet. But yeah, they could... Oh, 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 Diablo, Hellgate, X-Strike. They want to go for it. Here comes Cassia. Oh, and Genji is dead again. What a beautiful kill. There's the double kill. Oh, my God. They're going for the triple. They want X-Ray. They're hardos. What a beautiful execution here. Sexy plays all over the map now. That was incredible. And now they want to go for a 2-0 lead here. They get the bell tower conversion. It's a double all that is coming up. But check this one out again. Oh my god, that was well done. Like, look at this. Genji moving out. He gets completely crushed. Then they go for the follow-up kills here. Another wall stun. The APOC connecting beautifully. And of course, the blue team is now totally falling apart here. The two altars that are activating are more than enough to end the game in favor of the Hardos. They were so far behind. After the triple altar phase was locked in, it looked like it's over. But now Haas Ops with the channel... And they're going for the barrage. They're ending it with the barrage. They're not even going for the bottom here. Nope, they're ending it with a full barrage. Putting the final points to a 2-0 lead in the best of five series here. Yeah, Master Slash, here's on the Storm match. We are on play day three and the Hardos, they are dominating. The Hardos, the 2-0 lead, everybody. Damn, these guys are on fire today. Seriously, they are stepping it up play day after play day. During the qualifiers, the Hardos got absolutely demolished. They barely qualified in the fourth qualifier after three teams were already able to qualify for the Masters Clash. And it really felt like the Donuts and also 30k were a step ahead of them. But now, since the team has been playing together for a couple of weeks, you can really see a lot of the synergy coming through. And it is just... It's scary. It's really scary. There was such a big lead for 30k in the last game, and then they just turned it around again. So I gotta say that this is... It's a little bit crazy. If the Hardos lock in a 3-0 victory here, that would be amazing for them. That would be huge. 
So if they can do it, then whew, that would be a big issue for 30k. And 30k, they had. I feel like they had their best showing really at the first qualifier for the Masters Clash, as I said earlier. This is where they were able to win the tournament, qualify directly as the first team. And since then, I kind of feel that the Hardos and also the Donuts started to overshadow them a bit. But time will tell if here in Infernal Shrines, the team in blue is able to finally put a dent into the defense of the Hardos and put the first point onto the scoreboard to maybe start that comeback. But as it stands, the Hardos just seem a bit unbeatable. On Towers of Doom, a lot of the fights didn't end in their favor initially, and then when the Triple Altar phase got completely taken by 30k, it felt like the Hardos would lose the game. They were down to 8 points against, I think it was 21 on the side of 30k, but boy did they turn it around. And I feel a bit of it was also because 30k started to end a little bit, like really stagger deaths and play a bit too aggressive, more than they should. Now that we're in game 3 on the draft, we have pretty much the same ban pattern here. Sonya gets locked in as an early pick, Infernal Shrines obviously caters to her strengths extremely well. Diva comes in together with that, Tykers for the Odin connect on the shrine, and also for potential uh, burn downs against opponents' heroes. I mean, there's Junkrat. Alright, bit of a different setup now. And we got Deckard Kane together with it. Alrighty, so let's have a bit of a look of what they can do with that. Um, but yeah, either way. Mm, right, so. Uh, what do we get on the bands? Because first of all, they got Kane is already good for Shrine Control. You got Sonya, you got Junkrat that has definitely the displacement that they can use. And at the same time, with the ban now coming in, uh, we're gonna get the, uh, May removed again. Masquerade has been playing it a lot. And again, if he gets Diablo in his hands, he would probably play that one too. But I got a bit of a feeling that Bad Benny is gonna try and go for Dibbles once more. They could, of course, play instead of Varian with their Nuburak, which in the past they've done a lot, but in at least this play day and the last one, Bad Benny has played a lot more Anub uh, Diablo, and it fits really well for the map, of course, too. So, yeah. Uh, let's see what they're banning out. Carrigan. <laughs> yeah, it's Nick's second favorite Carrigan map. I, he played it on Towers of Doom. He played it, most of all, on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen but also in Infernal Shrines, a lot of Carrigan games, and uh, this time at least 30k is playing it better safe than sorry, and just says, you know what, whatever else they throw at us, Carrigan is more of a problem. If they start with any kind of stuns and then Carrigan follows up on it, and they allow Tychus to get the entire duration of the minigun through the Mitch's Toast. But as expected, here's the Diablo pick. So Diablo is taken, and they get Anduin together with that. That already helps you also if your opponent is trying to go for, let's say, Leoric and starts to set in tombs up. Triple frontline is of course still possible, but keep in mind that the Quasar has already locked in Sonya. So yeah, Anduin in the game. And what else are we getting? The last two picks, I mean again, this is for all the marbles now, right? Either you finally put a point onto the board, or you're going down without even taking a single map. Johanna for the extra wave clear on the objective, and together with that Grey main. They can chunk Diablo down with a bullet. They have Sonya together with that. And Greymane is also great for the wave clear, of course. And if you can at any point set up a decent push, let's say with a Frozen Punisher, Greymane is your boy. He's gonna chunk it down quickly. So, yeah, Nick being the last pick. And what's it gonna be? For the Hardos. They are finishing it out with Chromie. The Chromester, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So, we got Chromie in the game. Then Infernal Shrine's coming up. The Hardos are in a 2-0 lead against 30k. And let's see what the blue team can do. Can they put a point on the board or not? The Hardos, they're going uh, strong here on the third play day of the Masters Clash. Let's see if they can win the Heroes of the Storm three series with a 3-0 or not. It is time to shine, everybody. We have our third map coming up. 30k on Infernal Shrines with Deckard Kane, played by X-Ray Ultralisk on Greymane, Dainu on Junkrat, Masquerade on Johanna, and Dequaza is playing Sonya. On the right side of the map, Hazorps on Chromie. We got Bad Benny on Diablo, Nick on Tychus, Yazu on Anduin, and Chris on Diva. As two of the German players are channeling their inner weep over here. So, as we're starting things off, we already have Jojo specking straight on level 1 into the hold your ground. The tricky shuffles are in for a Junkrat. And they really gotta step it up. They played a... Honestly, game 2 wasn't bad at all. They had such a great 
mid-game on the second map. Towers of Doom was looking fantastic for them. And then they kind of played a bit too aggressive, a bit too greedy, they fell apart there. And <laughs> honestly, at points it was a bit painful to watch because they just squandered a huge lead that they had. Now a lot of this was of course because the Hardos just exploited all of the mistakes that were made, no matter how small they were, ruthlessly. And did it exceptionally well. But it always felt that 30k could have prevented some of those deaths and some of the momentum that built up for the Hardos. Either way, you gotta appreciate how strong the red team is at this point. And they just did fantastic. So, we'll find out what's gonna happen here. There's traps already being set up again. Ultralisk, he is slowly starting to rotate. And it's a trap! And this is not looking good, is it now? He's trying to escape, and honestly, it got close there for a moment, but Greymane gets killed anyways. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you set up a trap in Heroes of the Storm. You have to have a bit of an idea of how the opponent is supposed to play, where they're supposed to go, and then you're trying to intercept them. So, and because it was such a teaching moment, let's take a look. Look at it, beautiful. Ultralisk moves in. And, yeah, he just gets attacked from all angles. He nearly escaped. Well, not really. I mean, he tried. Did a good job attempting to get out of harm's way. But this is exactly the Chinese bush meta that <laughs> just made so much fun back in, uh, I think, 2017. 2016, actually. When the Chi Chinese teams were just absolutely incredible. Edward Gaming and uh, all of those boys. Uh, those were the days. Where you had the Chinese just waiting in all the bushes, playing with vision like nobody else did back then. And that yeah, was pretty incredible. But these traps are, of course, perfect. And now, uh, instead, we are seeing a go for Kuromi and win with a save! <laughs> and Dainu nearly pays the price for it, but Nick goes down because Junkrat was able to isolate him after all. So they steal the camp away and they get the counter kill. Good for 30k. Nicely done. Masquerade with a pause. So it seems like one of them has dropped. And I've talked a bit earlier about the problems that apparently Ultralisk had with his connection. This doesn't seem to be an exception. But it also allows us a little bit about uh, to go over what has just been going. Actually, no, because we're already back to business. Yeah, well, good for uh, good for Ultralisk. At least the problem doesn't seem to be a big one. What I was about to say, though, is that thanks to the isolation of Junkrat on the target, they were able to take the camp and the kill. So it's a slight lead in the experience that all of this results in. And they also have taken two out of the three camps at the bottom, so pretty neat for them. The lead in the experience will also translate into an early level 7 talent. And for the Shrine fight, that's kind of important. Now, it doesn't carry you through the entire battle, but it will at least allow you to get a small lead and take position on the Shrine itself. And in a game on this level, that kind of matters quite a bit. Now, as it stands, we got our level 7 talents in, but on the level 4, the bigger they are has once again been committed to by Nick. So he's going to try and chunk the target down quickly before uh, the rest of the team, Chrome in particular, is going to attempt to put the finishing touches in. Jungle and Chromie, talking about them, are currently rotating between the lanes for the extra experience to get the extra talent. Up at the top, they're already making the play, and the blue team is slightly ahead on the minion stacks. 15 to 7, Ultralisk has to jump out. He has the wave clear, but he doesn't have the hit points left any longer. So, right now, the rotation towards the top is slowly happening again, but there's the level 7. They got it a little bit quicker, they got the spear, and the red team now has to play incredibly slow and safe. The Hardos on the move back, they're about to lock their own talent in. But right now, they are still fighting with a disadvantage, especially since Chromie isn't here. But Junkware just joined the fight, it's a 5 versus 4 for now. Yeah, there's the explosion on the D.Va, gets pushed back by Junkrat, and they're still fighting the battle here as Ultralisk is homing in on Hazu and puts Chromie under pressure. But at the same time, it's a kill against Sonya. Bad Benny with another great stun. They are hoping for a counter kill, as you can see. Ultralisk is diving in deep into the back line. The Mortar Punisher gets taken by the Hardos, though. And now they're making a play for Greymane, uh, Grey and it seems like he's going to die, too. That's two heroes down and the objective claimed by the Hardos. Again, they are just controlling these fights so incredibly well. These guys are just insane. I mean... Again, think about how well 30k does against any other team. We're talking about the top three in Europe here, where 30k, the Donuts and the Hardos, they're dominating the other teams that they're going up against. They're doing exceptionally well. They're playing such a strong Heroes of the Storm. And now in a match between the number two and the number three in the standings right now, the Hardos are just punishing the opposition. 
it's going to be so much fun to honestly observe the Masters Clash over the next couple of weeks and see which team establishes themselves all the way up at the top. The Donuts are, of course, watching all of this too. They are, they are still in the number one spot, but they still have to go up against teams like the Hardos. So it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic series and season in uh, this Heroes of the Storm League. It's going to be great. The Masters Clash is going to be spectacular. Three kills to one. And of course, with the Masters Clash, we can still all hope for an offline final. I mean, this is what the uh, event is trying to do in the first place. And with vaccinations rolling out in Europe and the situation getting better in pretty much every country, with still a couple of months left before we're talking about the uh, offline final and an event, it's very likely that we're going to get that offline final in France. So, fingers crossed. But even without it, what we're having in the regular season already is quite spectacular. Because right now, with level 10 in their hands, the Hardos, they are again taking the map. They're taking the camps, every single one they can, as you can see on the minimap. And they're hoping to also steal this one away. <laughs> nice attempt by Dino, though. Like, he's always trying to just simply use those mines, get someone out of position. Now the Fountain has been taken out, and the Hardos, they of course know what the dangers are when they move into a position like this. But, yeah, it was still a nice thought, and those plays can, of course, be fantastic if you make it happen. Now, anyways, we got the bullet in, and that puts additional pressure on Diablo in those team fights. We're still waiting for Jojo to take her ult, and also for the old man. Uh, Chromie has gone for the timeout again. And Johanna, normally when you see her holding back her ult, that lets me to believe we might see a jump into the back line. Trying to make that play with a falling sword for Anduin, for Chromie, putting her under pressure, forcing the timeout on her. There's already a bit of poke happening from Dino, but yeah, they're not going to reveal that until the next team fight, most likely. Well, if they can get a collapse on someone and maybe rotate in with a flank, a good blessed shield might also do the trick for them. The damage output for Tychus is pretty significant here with the 15,000 that he is holding. The Lulnado! We're going full Lulnado on Deckard Ken now. All right, the old man. A bit tired of telling stories, apparently. They're going for Bad Benny at the bottom of the map. And there's the Apocalypse. They want to go for the counter engage. Falling sword. And here's the Reptire. And Nick. Nick goes down. Nearly escaped. De Quasa with a 3-2-3 moment. The pause in the middle of the fight. Grey main disconnected again. Ultralisk is out of the fight right now, but they still got the kill. Yasu is jumping around. At this point, Anduin is in mid air. Whee! I believe I can fly. Well, he can definitely fly around a little bit, but Bad Benny is, of course, the next one who could technically be attacked here, but he still has too many hit points. Ultralisk gets out. Greymane is back. Quite the unfortunate moment for a disconnect, but it all worked out in the end for them. But that could have, of course, been a disaster. Can you imagine them getting the kill against Tychus and saying, like, guys, finally some momentum in our hands let's go and then the disconnect leads to a death on gray main and it's a four versus four on the map that would have been a big issue but now we are two kills to three experience is fairly even still a battle at the bottom of the map as you can see and off we go it's shrine time and this time we're talking about an arcane punisher they're starting to make the way in Hazorb's already on the retreat. Nick is coming in with his Tychus. It's a 5 versus 5 again. And Odin gets popped right away. Ultralisk. They're going straight for it and they're pushing them back. The more, oh, the objective is actually dead even now. Slowing sand still to control all of this. Masquerade with a quick tap at the fountain as they're starting to go in. The old man waiting for the cooldown to be back up so he can use his little Nado again. But at least Jojo could stomp into the back line with a falling sword. And is most likely going to do that soon. The lead for the blue team on the objective at least. Here comes the explosion. Reptire. And that one didn't do anything. They're still trying for the kill against Ultralisk, but he's trying to turn it against Nick, and the Arcane Punisher gets taken by the blue team as they're still going for the next battle here. De Quasa's a little bit low, but he spins out of harm's way. They're trying to close the gap with Masquerade jumping in on the Falling Sword, but they cannot connect with the target. Breaking through the wall and capitalizing on the attack is what they really need to do. Sonya had to retreat, though, and move to the top lane to defend the keep as the fort has already fallen, and they're trying to save at least the main structure. But down here, the engage! on Junkrat and they take him down. Junkrat is dead and so is Greymane. The double kill. The engage is there and the Hardos again following up in these fights with kill after kill. 
Beautiful setup here. They came in, they go for Junk Red, they get the kill on him quickly, and then they can follow up as Nick comes in from the top with the overkill, and bam, they take down the second hero. Five kills to two, they took the camp at the bottom, they're going straight up for the next one here on the left side. The Hardo is once again in control. Every time it seems like 30k is making another step back into the game, the Hardos are shutting it down. We're 10 minutes in and the situation is pretty fantastic for the Hardos, given that the last objective ended up in the hands of the blue team. So right now, the structures are starting to take damage, the fountain in the mid lane has been eliminated, the fort has suffered a bit. It's not a big lead, but it's there. And it's more the experience gap that is starting to be a concern. Yeah, they're trying to go for Chris. Careful, the Lulnado and Anduin. <laughs> Anduin is just cheating again, isn't he? Yeah, immediately just like pull, pushing them back out. 29,000, the damage output for Tychus. And 26,000 for Junkrat. Like, really important in the last fight was, of course, also that top lane pressure. It forced Equaza back, and that allowed the hardest to go for that fight at the bot lane in the first place. So, again... One of the big things that really determined the outcome of the fight was not necessarily the setup at the bot lane. It's what, what they did previously to force Sonya to defend the top lane instead. That's how you establish these small advantages that then help you in the team fights and allow you to quickly collapse onto someone. Lulnado and another disconnect on Ultralisk. I mean, the Ultralisk is going strong today, but <laughs> I mean, damn son. Like, that internet connection, someone needs to sponsor that guy some, some 5G or something, like, I don't know. And I don't know why, but every single time we're pausing the game, someone is just jumping around on the map. So, <laughs> is he saluting? Is, is, is that a mid-air salute here from Dino? <laughs> I kind of think so. But yeah, th that internet connection is kind of crazy. And that's, of course, also getting a bit annoying for the Hardos, I would assume. But Benny is completely isolated here with the little NATO. We still got Hazops and Yasuo at the side. I guess Anduin is going to have an easy time pulling Bad Benny out. I don't think there's enough damage output that can connect quickly enough with Diablo to seal the deal here. But, yeah, Ultralis. I mean, honestly, it's, it's annoying for both teams. It's annoying for the blue team because they always have to reset. Yeah, they might get the kill here. They will get the kill here. Anduin was apparently still on cooldown. There's the rip tire after the falling sword. Trying to go and push Nick back in. But the problem is that not only did Diablo fall, Sonya died too. So it's a kill against the kill. And Dibbles is back. And they're getting the Junkrat kill too. Uh, yeah, tricky times for them. But as I said, the disconnects are not only annoying for the Hardos, they're also very annoying, of course, for 30k, since one of their players is continuously disconnecting and they always have to mentally reset in these fights. The bullet connects with Bad Benny, super low. But here we go. Yeah, 16 talents already. The Hardos, they are trying to exploit that advantage as best they can. Next objective spawns at the top and is now announced, but they want to go for the bottom fort, as you can see. A staggered kill against the blue team would be uh, the dream now. 30k, they're just now getting Junkrat back. If you get a kill now, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Aswops, he wants to connect the damage so that he can take that fort down. That would establish some catapult pressure at the bottom of the map. <laughs> They're gonna try. Yeah, Nick is moving in and he uh, is using the grenade. Bad Benny was with him, so if there would have been a flank on an attempt to go on Tychus, he could have just helped him out, create some space, and helped him move back. But the level 16 talents are now there, so it's at least even talents for as the teams are moving topside for the aggression. And before they move top, we even have Nick dealing with another camp at the bottom of the map. Or sorry, another wave at the bottom. And in the middle of the map, we're seeing a very similar picture, even pressure against the fort itself. So they're really trying to establish lane pressure on all sides, with the exception of the top, because they're giving this one up. They're just letting this one slide. Instead, they are pushing for the fort in the middle. And if they get this one, that would be a pretty big win. Because even with the Punisher at the top, it's not guaranteed that 30k is doing all that much damage. Especially if Junkrat dies. And he does the grenade, yes! But Tychus also falls. They're trying to go for Chromie. Ultralisk is moving out quickly. And in comes the trap with Bad Benny. Yeah, he goes for the Admiral Akbar move. It's a trap! As they're straight up going for the guy with the beard and take Deckard Kane down. 
No respect for the elderly over here. Another Sandblast combo hits Greymane. Three heroes down. Unbefucking leaveable. The Hardos, honestly, they're turning up the heat here. It is getting nasty. Another killer. Sonya is dead. The top forward has fallen. The Frozen Punisher is moving slowly towards the keep. But you know what's moving towards the keep too? The Red Paint Train that is moving through the bot lane. As they are breaking through the wall right now. I don't give a fuck about that top lane. I was like, Punisher, what? What are you talking about? Spray game is on point as well. And now it's time to try and take the keep down here. Not even sure if they can get the entire thing though. Because they don't want to fight. They want to get level 20 first. So yeah, they're doing some damage. But then they retreat. Tigers is already dealing with the top here. Big simply goes for the Punisher. And that defends the top quite easily. But oh boy, a 7 kill lead. And 30k just YOLOs. They're just YOLOing right now. They're trying to force the fight before level 20. That's actually a good move. You might look at this and think, hey, this is a little bit reckless. But honestly, first of all, this isn't League of Legends. Second of all, and neither is it Fnatic. But second of all, this is also uh, just a fight that you're attempting to force before level 20 hits. You know perfectly well that once your opponent has Storm Talons, you're gonna be in uh, deep shit anyways. So... Uh, Try and force the battle before the Storm Talent gives you an even talent fight. Now you have to try and recover hit experience points for nearly two levels. Yeah, so it might have been an aggressive move by uh, Masquerade with Jojo, but it was also the smart thing to do here. At least take the camp, relieve some of the pressure, and let's see what else they can do. But as it stands, it's a two-level advantage, and those Storm Talons are, of course, going to be a problem. And this is exactly why the Hardos are moving out as they do. But, yeah, they go for Bad Benny. Nice trap with Junkrat, but they can't get the kill. Here comes the next quick push, and they are just trying to get the hell out of there. <laughs> just try and get away from this. The big issue is going to be the next try, because I don't think that they can get all the experience to level 20 that they need. And now that they're moving towards the bottom of the map, you can already tell that the Hardos are going to try and go for the keep. They could even go for the big red button with Nick. There's no problem dropping Odin here if you really want to. So if they feel the need for it, they could make it work, but they also could go for core if they get a kill. And they're trying desperately to make that happen. There's the APOC, one down, two down, Ultralis. Did he disconnect again? He just stood there. He just stood there and fucking took it. I think he disconnected in the middle of the APOC. And that all of a sudden is the end of the keep and very likely the end of the game. Here comes the big red button. Oh boy, 13 kills, 2-4. And this is not looking good for 30k. The Hardos with an insane series today. What the hell? A 3-0 against 30k. That is incredible. They just solidified their position in the top three by so much. This is honestly insane. What a perfect outcome for them. This couldn't have gone any better. What a fantastic series for the Hardos. And a huge setback for 30k here at the Master Slash. GG and well done. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.